first and second Kings. Um, let me just say for a second why why I'm doing this seminar. Um, I grew I grew up reading the Bible in a family that we read the Bible every single night, and um, I didn't particularly love the Bible. It was just kind of what you did. You engaged it. But then I went to, when I was an undergrad, I had to actually read through the Bible, uh, the whole thing, and I uh, got to read text, the, the entire text. And it was kind of the first time I feel like I got to see the forest uh, instead of just the individual trees. During sabbatical, I went to Hawaii, and there was this one uh, hike I went on with a friend, a colleague, and we met in this neighborhood at just the end of the street, started this hike. We were kind of in some woods and it was nice. And there was a couple of nice trees here and there, but it didn't feel super remarkable until I got to this point where all of a sudden there was a clearing and you could kind of stand up and look out over the canopy of trees and realize, oh, I'm at the top of this, this kind of a bluff and I can see this entire like forest I'm in the center of. And then I kind of got a glimpse of the beauty and then all of a sudden that made the whole trail and the whole journey feel so much more significant and had a different feel to it. And the same way with scripture, we can kind of learn to zoom out and see the big picture. It makes uh, the individual trees we come across when we're reading it uh, more beautiful and more kind of carry more significant. And I think that's important in a book like uh, First and Second Kings, because there are a lot of trees, okay? Um, we're going to start a sermon series on it next week, and together, First and Second Kings is 47 chapters of material, and um, you don't have to, you're not going to be able to look at all this in detail, but it covers uh, nearly about 500 years of history. Uh, David Solomon, this is like 1980, 960 BC. And it's going to go all the way to uh, after Solomon to the division of the Israelite nation in between the northern kingdom focused in Samaria, the southern kingdom focused in Judah. And so you kind of get two sets of kings. Then you start tracking all the way to the exile of um, the northern kingdom by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. I'm going to give you another slide here that kind of shows some of this. Uh, um, this one, again, it's almost impossible to read. It's just showing you um, on the right are the kings of the south and on the left are the kings of uh, the northern kingdom. And so uh, Assyria comes and takes over and captures and kind of assimilates the northern kingdom in 722 BC. And then you just track the southern kingdom and then they get ex brought into exile by Babylon in 586 BC. And over the course of this story, you hear about the rule of over 40 different kings, plus a few little prophets in there, mainly Elijah and Elisha, but a few other ones. So that is a lot of trees, right? And it's such a massive amount of material. Like just look at that slide is hard to comprehend, right? Um, it's such a massive amount of material that's covered in these 47 chapters that you can really easily lose your bearings as a reader when you're going through it. For one, just reading through it, it can like it starts out kind of nice. Like Solomon gets like the first 11 chapters are all on Solomon, and it's kind of like oh, get some detail. It's this nice rich story. You guys remember the like the dream about wisdom and and the the story about the cutting of the baby in two. It's kind of like oh, this is great. Then it starts speeding up and you get all this drama and king after king and after king. And it starts to feel repetitive and not exciting. If you've ever tried to read through first and second Kings, I'm guessing a little after Solomon, you're like, all right, can I just start flipping ahead here? Where, where's the story going? Um, uh, for example, by the time you get to second Kings fifth chapter 15, in just one chapter, it covers seven different Kings. In one chapter, okay? Like that's a ton of history packed into one chapter. Uh, take, for example, the story of King Pekakiah. I don't even know how to say that. Uh, this is just a great example. In the 50th, you'll get things like this. In the 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekakiah, son of Menahem, became king of Israel and Samaria, and he reigned two years. Pekakiah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn from the sins 
away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which had caused Israel, he had caused Israel to commit. One of his chief officers, Pekah, son of Ramalia, conspired against him, taking 50 men of Gilead with him. He assassinated Pekahiah, along with Argob and Aria, in the citadel in the royal palace at Samaria. So Pekah killed Pekahiah and succeeded him as kings. The other events of Pekahiah's reign and all he did, aren't they written in the book of the annals of the king of Israel? The end. Um, so pretty much the account of every king in the book follows this formula here. A statement about where the king came from, whether that king did evil or what was right in the eyes of the Lord, how the king died, and then an invitation to go read more in the annals of the king of, of uh, Judah or uh, of Israel if you're interested. Um, and when you encounter as a, a reader the ba that basic storytelling formula 40 times in a row, let's just be honest, boredom can kind of seep in and you start to assume this whole book is just kind of an uninteresting forest of, I don't know, pine trees. And, and uh, a couple of the trees are, are big and strong and fun to look at, but the rest are kind of diseased and dying and, and not really worth your attention. And so it can feel that way with first, second Kings. Like this is just a long march through some events in history. And it tells us who the bad kings are, a few of the good, who the few good kings are. Some you might, some of this you might want to stop and spend a little time with. But overall, this is just an inventory, a historical inventory. That's how I always approach this book. Maybe you did too. But I've learned that if that's how we approach it, we actually miss the forest. We get lost in the trees or we get bored by the trees or we start our eyes start glazing over as we look at the trees. Uh, so the first thing is just to consider what what kind of book. What kind of story are we looking at? And it's first let's just name this is. It's not less than history, but this is more than a historical record. OK, it's more than history. We actually know that other histories that narrated the major events that take place in this book already exist. In fact, this book keeps making reference to them. It assumes that uh, if you want to know about the accomplishments out in the world of these kings, go consult kind of the worldly history. Go read the annals of the kings. Uh, so the, the author already knows that kind of textbook history exists, yet still gives us this. So it's more, he wants to do something, he, she wants to do more something than just report on the major events. So what kind of book, what kind of stories uh, the narrator telling? Well, it's helpful if we look at, if we, if we zoom out and uh, from a thousand feet, foot view and kind of look at what is the dramatic arc that we see in this First and Second Kings chunk of narrative. What are the starting and ending points of the story? Right. A lot of times, as the as readers of the Bible, we just start on page one and start reading, and who knows if we'll never get to the end. It's great to zoom out and get a sense of what's the whole. And it's really interesting when you do that. Um, the first, you know, the first couple chapters are almost like a prologue. It's about the transition from. David to Solomon, but then from chapter three to chapter 11, it focuses on introducing Solomon and his reign in Jerusalem. I talk about how Jerusalem's kind of wealth builds up and it, it's really glorious in its detail about how all this gold and all this stuff is coming to, to Solomon and in Jerusalem and how the temple is built. And the text goes in, in dramatic detail about how they how they built it and, and, and just the glories of this temple as it was being built and God's presence come and, and like descends on it. So that is the starting point. OK, the glory of Israel as expressed in the gold of Jerusalem and, and, and the wonders of this temple and Solomon's reign. Right. And, he, and he's so wise and people are coming from all over the place uh, to visit him. But what's the major events that frame the ending of the book? It's almost the exact reverse. The last few chapters narrate how it's just Judah and Solomon's dynasty, his bloodline of kings 
come to a, a bloody sad end. It talks about how Babylon comes and lays siege to Jerusalem and destroys it. Um, and how Solomon's temple is destroyed. So the last seven chapters are the undoing of the first seven chapters. All right. So why is that frame important? Because when you zoom out and see that frame, you can't miss the sense of dramatic coherence between the opening and the ending. It starts with long, dramatic, detailed descriptions of the people uh, making and filling the temple with bronze and gold articles. It gives a sense of just status and, and glory. And, and um, it's, it's a moment in history that is Israel's crowning glory. And all the dramatic energy is used to emphasize that. And how does the book end? All of that is reversed. And it ends with the removal of the people and the, and the, the temple and even the glory of the temple being taken away. And so uh, the text is not content. If you, if you got to read that final chapter in preparation, um, let's see, I might have it on a slide. Uh, I don't think I have it on a slide here. Uh, that final chapter, it tells us that Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon, not only did he set fire to the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and all the houses of Jerusalem, the text actually goes into the exact details about how they stripped the temple of its glory. It says, uh, I think this is chapter 25, verse 13, the Babylonians broke up the bronze pillars, the movable stands and the bronze sea that were at the temple of the Lord, and, and they carried the bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots and the shovels and the wick trimmers and the dishes and all the bronze articles used in the temple service. The commander of the imperial guard took away the censers and sprinkling bowls, all that were made of pure gold or silver. Now, if you were just reading that on its own, you might be that's some uninteresting kind of boring detail. But when you zoom out, what you see is it's trying to create a sense of drama and undoing of where we started of how we started with the detailed description of the construction of the temple and we end with its detailed destruction. And so what then do we get as a sense of dramatic arc? What do you call a story that starts at this height of glory and ends at the depths of defeat and ruin? That's a called a tragedy. So this is more than a history. First, second Kings from like a narrative perspective is a tragedy, a, tra a tragic story. And so almost all scholars agree that the retelling of this tra tragedy is written while the Israelites are living in exile. So they've been taken over to Babylon and they are stuck here in exile. They're li living in the shadow of this great ruin. So I want you to think, imagine yourself as an Israelite in exile. Now you don't have the internet to get all the different opinions on what went down. All you have is the annals of the kings of Israel and Judah as kind of your historical reference point to kind of make sense the last 500 years. And what you read there is that at some point, your king, your people, your nation were at the top of the world. You were the envy of the world. Your capital city was filled with bronze and gold. But now hundreds of years later, you are in the exact opposite position. You're stuck in Babylon. You have no social power. You're a stranger in a foreign land. It's disorienting. And what questions would you, you be asking as you look back on that experience? You'd be saying, what happened? What happened to our people? What went wrong? We were on the top. Now we're on the bottom. And the institutions that defined us, our royal government, our temple, our land, they've been destroyed. We've been we're not even in them anymore. I thought God was in the temple. I thought God had led us and called us to, the, to be this nation. I thought God had given us these kings. Has God failed us? Did God just stop showing up for us? And if God forsook, forsa has forsaken us, what kind of hope do we have here in exile where we're just cut off from all of that? So those are the primary spiritual questions that people are asking in exile. And those are the primary questions 
that this text is written to answer. It's meant to be a theological interpretation of this 500 year unfolding tragedy, trying to answer, trying to help a people in exile answer, did God fail us? And what hope, what kind of hope do we have now if that's where we've come from? And because part of the task of this narrative is to answer that question, did God fail us? Uh, some scholars categorize this book as an exercise in, in theodicy. Uh, I'll pause. Does anyone know what a theodicy is? Feel free to unmute and give a definition. I can't see you because I'm looking at my screen. So oh, unmute. So it's, um, you know, if God's all powerful and loving and everything, how did this, how did he let this happen? And trying to explain. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's one, ver what Mila said is one version of it. Uh, the word theodicy comes from two Greek words, theos, God, and uh, DK, which comes like the Greek uh, righteousness is diakonosune, uh, but it uh, means ju to justice or what's right. And a theodicy is any attempt to demonstrate the justice or, or the faithfulness, righteousness of God in the face of some kind of injustice or tragedy or suffering or evil. And so there's kind of philosophical theodicies that try to take on the problem of evil. But this is in some ways a more practical theodicy of like, where is God? How, how did God allow this, this ruin to happen? Where's God's justice and, and, and fairness and all of that? Because we're totally, we're totally disoriented and we really want to know. Um, and so the author of um, First and Second Kings, what, he's, uh, what they're trying to do is to write to the fellow exiles and say, yes, our history is tragic, but it's not because God failed us. It's not because God abandoned us. It's not because God was unjust towards us. No, this, this is the story of how God actually has been working faithfully in and through our history the whole time. And because uh, God has been present, and because God is a certain kind of God, we can also have hope for a way out of this. So it's actually meant, this book is meant to make a theological point that God has actually been just. And so we're going to try to get to that tonight. How does a story tell a story about God's just? justice and, and faithfulness and then if God's been faithful and just what kind of hope do we have as we're in exile all right um, just a few other notes about what kind of book this is um, uh, the author because it's a theological angle on this tragedy um, the author's often going to skip over or barely mention things that are of great historical importance. Um, consider kind of from a secular perspective in terms of big accomplishments while zooming in on things that history books would typically overlook. And so it's kind of an example of that. If you read 1 Kings 16 and 17, uh, one of the characters you'd come across is King um, Omri of the Northern Kingdom. And the Bible includes, 1 Kings includes, eight verses on him. And pretty much, he's just an unimportant, not so great king, remarkable only for the fact that he did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. But eight verses, and we're already moved on past him. But what's interesting is almost any kind of modern encyclopedia or like non-biblical scholarship on Omri will talk about him as this awesome king, this dynamic and powerful figure. So from like Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, it taught, he's con he conquered Moab and he formed an alliance with Tyre and moved the capital of Israel uh, to Samaria and he brought stability following a period of riots and disorder and he adopted a policy of toleration for local religion and hope, helped reduce tensions between the Israelites and the Canaanite tribes. Oh, so this guy was actually pretty good and had this nice tolerance policy. Uh, First Kings isn't interested in all that. Um, so the accomplishments of a historically successful king can all be but ignored at times. The narrator really only comments on his relationship with God, Omri's relationship with God. That's meanwhile, in the very next chapter, 
the story will spend nearly an entire chapter talking about how God is working in the life of an unnamed foreign widow and how God uses her to witness to God's power and feed a prophet whose words are going to be about the only hope left for Israel's future. And so just think about that, how this, this author, this narrator is helping re people people reshape how they think about history. And the invitation for the exiles and for us and for anyone who's ever felt like things have fallen apart is to say, maybe you should rethink when you look at the past, what you think is most important and who you think is most important and what success is and what actual failure is. And so this is some of the stuff in which the, how this narrator is playing with history and kind of inviting us to re, uh, rethink what's really important. Um, so it's different. So the theological history is different than a secular history. So don't read this to find out what happened. Find it, uh, read it for what the, the theology is. Um, but that brings us to another point, which is this is not the only historical retelling of these events in scripture itself. And I mentioned this on my sermon uh, on scripture this summer, that first and second chronicles largely tells the story of the exact same events as uh, first and second Samuel and first and second Kings. So that narrative unit is in parallel to chronicles, but they're told kind of differently. Uh, so in that sermon, I mentioned as one example, and it's a great example, the difference in the narration of power from uh, the transfer of power from David to Solomon. So in 1 Kings, David, he's portrayed as old, feeble, and bedridden. He's got this one son over here, Adonijah, who's trying to seize a throne. And David's just doing nothing about it. So the prophet Nathan and Bathsheba, uh, they intervene. They're like, come on, David, do something. And he's kind of out of it. And he's like, oh, yeah, I guess I did promise Solomon to be king. And so that, then he doesn't really ever get out of bed. He orders Nathan and his priest Zadok to go anoint Solomon as king. And they do that. But then that other son makes a scene at the altar and Solomon has to confront him and deal with it and get him in line before he becomes king. That's how it all goes down in First, in, in first Kings. How does this go down in Chronicles? It's like you're reading a different story. There's no sign of feeble David. Instead, he calls for a giant assembly as if like he's at the height of his power. The text literally says he rises to his feet. He gives a whole speech about how he's always known Solomon would be his successor as if he didn't need anyone to tell him or remind him that. They have a giant party. Everyone's happy, harmonious. And then it's David with all the people who anoint Solomon to be king. And First Chronicles 29, 24 even says, and all the officers and mighty warriors, as well as all of King David's sons, pledge their submission to King Solomon. So none of the drama with the other sons. It's just completely left out. Okay. So if you read through, all, if you read through all of Chronicles, you'll notice that it paints David, Solomon, and most of the kings as stronger, more unifying figures, and tends to not focus or even bring up their major moral failings. David and Bathsheba eh, doesn't get much mention. It's no mention in Chronicles. Um, it leaves out the majority of the whole story of the divided kingdom of the north. Just kind of, eh, we're not going to focus on that. We'll focus on Judah, David, Solomon, and, and that good stuff. And even, because you're like, how can you paint an ideal version of so many bad kings that are to come? Even the mediocre and really evil kings are sometimes painted in a more ideal brush. So in Kings, you get this guy, Asa, who's kind of a better than average king. Like if um, Omri's here, Asa's here, but he's not like a David or a Solomon. Uh, but in Chronicles, he's just painted as amazing and he leads this huge reform. Um, in Kings, one of the worst kings is a guy named Manasseh. Well, in Chronicles, you start reading Chronicles and it's like, OK, this one, this guy also is the worst. But then Chronicles starts talking about how Manasseh is then humbled by God, repents and leads a spiritual restoration. So none of that is in Kings. So even the worst king 
gets a shinier image in Chronicles. It's, it's like remarkable. So this is kind of like, how do we understand this? Uh, this is confusing. And many scholars have wrestled with this and I'm not an expert in any of this. What my take is indebted to one of my favorite scholars named Pete Enns. Um, and here's his basic take. Every text, every story told has a context a perspective from being it's told and context matters. So first, second Kings was written while the Israelites were in exile, disoriented, trying to make sense of how did we get here? And so the theological emphasis is what went wrong in our history, in our past to land us here. And so it wants to emphasize the sin, the division, the moral failures that led us into exile to create a mirror for the reader to look at themselves and say, where is that kind of sin in my life? How can I avoid it moving forward? But first and second Chronicles, even though it's telling the same story in the past, it's written from a different time. It's written when the Israelites had already returned back to Judah from exile. So they were in disorientation they're in a time of re trying to get reoriented. And they're at this fragile place where they're trying to rebuild life as a nation. They were literally putting the temple back together. They're wrestling with the words of the prophets who predicted a Messiah would come and put things right, would be kind of a just king. And so they're looking at the same past, but not for an honest account of how things unravel, but instead, for sources of confidence that can help us move into the future as we do this. You get the difference in those contexts there? And so from that perspective, as they look back on history, the, chronicle, the chronicler wants to tell a different story about the kings of Israel. Instead of focusing on the failures of kings, he wants to focus on their strengths, emphasizing how David, Solomon, and these other kings Point out the ways they created unity, how they put temple worship at the center of their rulings. And so it is an idealized reading of David and Solomon and these kings in many ways, but it's trying to give a portrait of the kind of king, ruler, the Messiah that the people are looking forward to, one who will unify and bring worship of God to the center of life and carry on this legacy of Judah. So I was trying to think about this. Um, like, when do we do this? And uh, one example I thought of is in our own nation and um, in our own discourse about kind of who we are in our own political world, all the time we narrate the legacy of our, our, of our past and past leaders, sometimes in different ways. So this summer I was listening to uh, the New York Times. They had this whole 1619 project. It's kind of controversial, but... Um, and they have a podcast that goes along with it. And the explicit goal of that project is to tell American history in a way that helps explain the persistent racism and inequality that plagued this country. So it's on the heels of all this racial reckoning in our country and trying to say, look at our past and say, where were the seeds of this? Like, well, how has this continued? And so at one point in this podcast, they actually go back to Lincoln. Right. And I, in my head, I've always been like, yeah, Lincoln emancipated the slaves like he's a good guy. But they highlight actual quotes from Lincoln and policy stances from different times in his career uh, that reveal a more calcul uh, calculating, complicated stance um, towards black people. That is something much less than kind of, kind of that full throated endorsement of racial inequality that we kind of associate with him. Uh, at one point, Lincoln advocates for black slaves to be free, but then states, well, you're kind of, the presence of a lot of free black slaves is troublesome. So why don't we just send you all back to Africa? And actually kind of floats this idea. And so this podcast is trying to highlight that. And the reason they're doing that is they're trying to show that Lincoln, even Lincoln had a checkered history. And it's trying to help me as a listener identify the ways how, yeah, I can be, pro-equal rights and uh, be all for equality, but within that, I can still maybe harbor opinions and endorse policies that might undermine those very ideals. 
So they're using the complicated nature of Lincoln. They're trying to bring that to the fore to help me see the complications in our current uh, space. That's one way of using our past. But any of us can imagine at the same time any number of contemporary politicians on a campaign trail looking to the future, kind of like they are in Chronicles, campaigning to say, this is how we go forward and making a rhetorical appeal to the legacy of Lincoln as someone who unified the nation, just made a, brought a big change, gathered a diverse coalition of voices and took a stand kind of just on the right side of history on life and equality. Uh, I was actually kind of looking up around for this and Barack Obama did this all the time. In his last State of the Union address, he invokes uh, the legacy of, um, of Lincoln and quotes his, uh, some of his addresses to the nation to kind of put himself in this tradition of like, yes, just like Lincoln, we are, we are at a point of major change and who I am and how I'm leading change is just like Lincoln. So Obama and the 1619 Project are both invoking Lincoln, but they're doing it for different reasons. Uh, one, to inspire hope. Look at this guy, he made a major change. I'm like him, I can make a change. One to say, no, he was complicated and we're complicated too. So I think that's maybe a helpful way. Hopefully that's helpful for you to think about the differences between first, second Kings and first, second Chronicles and how it's engaging and retelling the story and using history uh, for its context. Um, all right, I'm gonna pause there because that was kind of my introduction to like what the book is about. Let me pause on any of those kind of introductory questions before we dive into uh, some of the meat of the book here. And I can't see all of you, so if there's any questions, uh, Ruth, please flag or someone speak up. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, it sounds like we're doing good here. Maybe a little time check. I'm not seeing any questions. All right. Is it, everyone doing okay? Give me some thumbs up. All right. All right. So now we're going to get into what kind of forest is this? And how I want to take it is how does this book go about answering those two big questions? Did God fail? And what hope do we have now? Now in our sermon series, like on a Sunday, we're gonna look at like a snippet of a scripture or kind of an individual tree and um, consider individual passages or episodes and looking at how the text maybe answers these questions in that individual text. But what I want us, you to see this evening is that some of the answers to those questions the text is seeking to address are not just found in the individual episodes that make up the narrative, but also in the literary structure itself and the literary devices that the text is using. And so learning to notice and pay attention to the literary features will make you a better reader and interpreter of the book's theology. Uh, or to put it in a different way, the, the message and the medium are tied together. Um, and so the first thing I want to focus on are, let's see, literary echoes. So one narrative device used in 1st, 2nd Kings that helps create meaning is what I'd call echoes or literary echoes that invite some feature of Israel's past history. So if you're in exile and you're reading this, this story, there's going to be an echo from something that's even further back in your history. And you're kind of invited to say, what's the association? How maybe I should read Solomon in light of this thing in the past? Um, and so one reading tip for first, second Kings is developing an eye and an ear for echoes from the past, from Israel's past. A certain place name or person is often not just a matter of historical circumstance for the narrator. Sometimes it is, uh, but sometimes it's an intentional work of retelling Israel's history in light of its longer, deeper story with God from the beginning. So I'm, there's a lot of these. I'm going to talk about one of them and just give you an example, but I'll give you some other examples. 
Uh, gardens are an interesting thing that show up and like, oh, where have we heard gardens? And there's some gardens at different times uh, and vineyards that are plays a key role. Jericho is a, is a key place in Israel's history that will come up some different times. And so when you see these things that maybe be like, hey, that reminds me of something else in the Bible, take a little bit to like explore that in your mind and, and play with it. And you might get to, um, might find something. Uh, so, um, so I wanna talk about one of those this morning to get, uh, this not this morning, this evening to give you an example. Um, you know, the point of the, the stories we looked at is to kind of say, how did we get from this glorious point with Solomon to total ruin uh, and like Jerusalem, the temple being burned down and us being exiled. And so history has portrayed Solomon as the greatest of Israel's kings and one of the greatest kings ever. And that was kind of just part of the historical record. And so I actually think Kings wants to re-narrate uh, Solomon's story to show how actually the seeds of this tragic downfall were embedded there from the beginning. Now, most of us, I don't know about you, but most of us, we, we, we're more familiar with Solomon than we are with a lot of the other kings in First and Second Kings. And, and, and if I, I've read through the Solomon story many times and it's usually like, all right, he becomes king, he's super wise, he's in tune with God, God appears to him twice, it's going great, he builds the temple, God shows up in the temple, uh, just things are going well, and you get about seven chapters of that, and then in chapter 11, it's like, oh yeah, he, he had a lot of wives, he kind of, not good, God doesn't like that, they kind of caused him to worship foreign gods, and that wasn't happy, so it's like, Solomon, great 90% of the time, but then this wife thing, not great. And that's part of the story. But I actually think there's a lot more that I'd always been missing because I didn't have an ear for echoes. Uh, some of you, I invited you to, if you got to read 1 Kings 3 in advance, it's when Solomon's story starts in earnest. Now I'm just going to, I have that text up on there and just listen to it. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. Uh, the people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father, David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. And he actually then goes on as, in the chapters beyond that, kind of how he solves that by building the temple. Now, if I was reading First and Second Kings the typical way, just kind of paying attention to the trees right in front of my face, my focus would go right to that typical summary statement. Oh, he's a good one. He showed it. He's love for the Lord. Boom. Good king. Um, but if I'm a reader who has an ear for echoes and echoes of Israel's past, what or who might stand out in that very first verse? Feel free to shout it out. Uh, Pharaoh? Pharaoh, right? Egypt. Um, and if you're an Israelite, these words carry meaning. So what do those words signify in Israel's consciousness? Well, we were enslaved in Egypt. Pharaoh was the oppressor, the person God needed to save us from. In fact, the very reason we're in this land of Canaan at all and that we're flourishing is because of the, how God rescued us from Egypt. And the whole law, the covenant, the Ten Commandments, how is it framed? With reference to the events of the Exodus. I am the Lord your God. Who what? What is God's self-definition? Who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery? And what is the first thing King Solomon does? Made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. So as a reader who cares about literary echoes, this is an invitation to start listening for Egypt references and Pharaoh references as I go along in this story. And what happens if you do that as you read the Solomon narrative? This is literally like kind of where it starts, chapter three. You start to notice details you never noticed before 
And soon a different picture, a more complex picture of Solomon is emerging. So look at, I invited some of you to read chapter nine. Look at chapter nine. Uh, God has just appeared to Solomon and uh, it's, God appears to him, that's a good thing. Then there's a list of activities that Solomon does to build and expand the kingdom. And it seems like, okay, that's just a list of good stuff he did. And then the queen of Sheba visits and talks about how awesome he is. And so you might think the text is all about focusing on Solomon's greatness, visited by God, expanding things, visiting by a foreign queen. It all seems about Solomon's awesomeness because after all, we read from the beginning, he's one of the good ones. He's got love for God. Hi, Will. We've got a question from Lisa um, in the chat. Um, she's she's saying, do you want me to read it, Lisa? She, she says, I remember. I can, I can read it. Okay. So, so my question was sort of about like this comment, the people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places. And, and it didn't say whether they were sacrificing to God or to the local gods or, you know, high places were like possibly other gods maybe. So I was wondering if they were thinking, um, like I remember learning that gods were location-based, like they were like, you know, you had to be in a certain place to meet God. So I was wondering if they felt like God wasn't there or that because there was no temple. Um, yeah, so this is a big question and kind of where is God located is a big question. And I want to, I'll come back to that. So a couple okay. things, the high places. Um, so if you read, if you read, if we had read more of the context, so part of it was there wasn't a temple. So they started setting up other places to worship to God. So it still seemed like the Lord Yahweh, they were worshiping in this particular reference, um, but there's a sense that that wasn't kind of where God wanted them to. Later, though, and throughout the first and second kings, the issue is the high places become places where they worship other gods. Uh, um, and so this becomes an issue. So this this is kind of a debated piece. But then this uh, first kings really starts with this emphasis that God's in the temple and God's there. Uh, but then this is going to be kind of become... In some ways, that's a question for the exiles. Okay, then if our temple got destroyed and we're not even in that land, do we have any connection with God? And First and Second Kings is partially going to try to answer that of where do you find God if it's not in the temple? And we'll get to how they do that. Um, I, I'm thinking that in Genesis, then, um, you know, Abraham, the uh, the um, the, the patriarchs they they were you know sacrificing to to God all over the place when God um, you know revealed revealed God's self had a had a special word for them um, so it, it seemed like there must have been lots of holy places and then all of a sudden oh no it's got to be the temple yeah there's this little shift there towards like centralization I think during during Solomon um, and it's a, it's a complicated legacy. <laughs> um, um, good, great, great question, Lisa. And we'll, we'll, so I'll kind of, as we go on, do some hints back to that question about location. Um, uh, so going back to uh, 1 Kings 9, I was saying it's kind of a chapter that emphasizes, seems to be emphasizing Solomon's awesomeness. But if you start paying attention to the echoes, uh, you start noticing different, some different things. So I'm going to look at, let's, if you have your Bible, I have some on the screen, but you're welcome to look at 1 Kings 9. Let me switch the slide here. And um, it's really interesting. It goes, here's the account of the forced labor King Solomon conscripted to build the Lord's temple, his own palace, the terraces, the wall of Jerusalem, and all these other places. And then almost in a sidebar, Pharaoh, by the way, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had attacked and captured Gezer. He set it on fire. He killed its inhabitants and gave it as a wedding gift to his daughter, Solomon's wife. And Solomon rebuilt it. He built up lower Beth Horon, Baloth, and Tadmor in the desert within his land, as well as his store cities. 
and the towns for his chariots and for his horses, whatever he desired to build in Jerusalem and Lebanon and throughout all the territory he ruled. And there were still people left from the Amorites, Hittites, all these others, but they weren't Israelites. Solomon conscripted the descendants of all these people remaining in the land whom the Israelites could not exterminate to serve as slave labor as it is to this day. But Solomon did not make slaves of any of the Israelites. They were his fighting men, his government officials, his officers, his captains, the commanders of his chariots and charioteers. They were also the chief officials in charge of his projects. 550 officials supervising those who did the work. Okay, if you've got an ear for echoes of Israel's past, what stands out to you about this passage? Um, well, I'm just going to answer that just as we keep going here. Well, one, we get Pharaoh again, and now he's burnt, burning down a city and killing, killing everyone so it can be a wedding present. And Solomon's like, great, thanks for the present. Uh, um, so that's interesting. So this kind of friendly relationship with Pharaoh is there. Uh, and it's in a larger story about how Solomon is conscripting forced labor. Uh, so basically enslaving people from other nations. The Israelites are serving as the overseers in order to build up Solomon's store cities and build whatever he desired. Now, do you know the one other reference to store cities in the entire Bible? It's Exodus 1, 11, which reads, so they, that's the Egyptians, put slave masters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor, and they built uh, Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. So in this narrative, who is Solomon starting to reflect? It actually starts, there's almost some, uh, tragic irony here. Uh, and then if you go on to look at verses, I think I got them here, 25 to 28 in this chapter, it says three times a year, Solomon sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship another, offerings. Another question from Lisa, Will. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, no, nothing. Does he set the so, stage three every seven years? I don't know. Does it say oh, well, that? you don't have to. You don't have to answer these questions when I type them in. Okay. I'm just you can you can just save them for when they're appropriate. Okay, um, yeah, maybe I'll hit them yeah. pause. I, I just Actually, thought I that was just that fascinating. About, yeah, uh, I thought it was just fascinating that he does look like Pharaoh. Yeah, wow. Let me keep going because we're um, so in 25 to 28. He's, you know, he's full, it says he fulfills the temple obligations, but King Solomon also built ships at. Uh, Ezion Gaber, which is near Aloth and Edom, on the shore of the Red Sea. And Hiram sent his uh, sailors who knew the sea to serve in the fleet with Solomon's men. And they sailed to uh, Ophir, and I'm sure I'm not saying that right, and brought back 420 talents of gold, which they delivered to King Solomon. All right, so he's going to the temple three times a year, fulfilling the bare minimum of obligation. But what's he doing the rest of the time? He's He's back at the Red Sea. Remember that Red Sea? And uh, he's going back over it to Ophir, which many believe is in Egypt. And what's he doing? Why is he doing that? To get gold for himself, to build stuff. Um, and it's really interesting that the narrator includes these details because Red Sea, crossing it, that echoes back to the Exodus story. And it's also an echo to parts of the Torah uh, that speak to the past history of Egypt. And so actually in Deuteronomy 17, so this would be before, at, right after God, when God gives the law, after they come out of Egypt, after they've been delivered from it, God actually says, well, when you enter the land, the Lord, your God's giving you and taken possession of it and settled in it. And you say, let's set a king over us, like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Don't place a foreigner over you. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself. Well, wait a minute. Solomon was actually having to build an entire city for his horses and chariots using slave labor, kind of like Pharaoh, or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. Wait a minute. He's sending ships to Egypt, for the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. 
He must not make many wives. Okay, we're going to... That one's clear, uh, or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Um, so right at the start of the story in 1 Kings, we get all these echoes to the Exodus narrative. And so while King Solomon is trying to follow the ways of David, and he's building God's temple, he's also making an alliance with Pharaoh, starting to follow the ways of Pharaoh, leading the people to become like the Egyptians who oppressed them, and sending people back across the Red Sea purely for the sake of material gain. And these sort of echoes, whether it's to Egypt or, or different things, they're going to be found throughout First and Second Kings. Uh, in fact, if you fast forward 40 chapters to the end of Second Kings, almost the very end of the book, what do you find? Second Kings, I think I have it here. Second Kings 25, 26. This is pretty much how the story ends. The people get exiled off, but there's still a few left in Judah. And what happens to them? All the people from the least to the greatest, together with the army officers, fled to Egypt for fear of the Babylonians. Such an interesting thing. So through the use of echoes of Israel's past, the author kind of puts a narrative screen or frame over this tragic downfall from Solomon to the exile as kind of like the story of Exodus in reverse, the reversal of the Exodus. So what happened? So what, what is the story this person, uh, the narrator is trying to say? How, how did we go from glory to ruin? Well, how did things go off the rail? Well, one answer is, well, we made an alliance with the very people God saved us from in the first place. Our kings became like Pharaoh. God had rescued us out of the arms of Egypt, but we used our freedom to make a handshake with Egypt. And then when things fall, fell right apart, we ran back right into their arms. So I'm just trying to point this out as this is one way in which the narrator, again, is retelling this story, embedding it in stories of the past to help make narrative sense. It's like, and so that the idea is, oh man, how did we fall? Well, it's kind of a, just a reversal of Exodus. Uh, instead of trusting God to liberate us from slavery, we became like the slave masters and just went back to that condition. Um, all right, so I'm going to, so that's one thing, echoes. Um, there's two other literary features I kind of want to bring our attention to um, in the book. One is, uh, whoops. oh yeah, that's it, uh, formulas, okay? We saw this before, but almost every, th there's kind of a common literary formula that's used. And one of them is just this formula, this assessment of almost every king, he did good or he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so what reversed the direction of Israel's future? Well, on the one hand, it's straightforward. It's okay, the kings were either good, but it seems there are a lot of evil ones. Um, but when it comes to reading a narrative, formulas can be misleading. It can give the impression that kings are either just good guys or bad guys, as I actually have some of these like kids' Bibles, and it literally is like, all right, it teaches you to read things in a kind of this simplistic way. Every person's either a good guy or a bad guy. Um, and if you kind of just see this formula over and over, oh, he did good, or he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, you're just like, it's good or bad. Um, and then it gets us to think, all right, either I'm a good guy, like, um, who's on God's side, like, I don't know, Josiah, or I'm a bad guy who does terrible things like King Ahab. And if I don't sound like a bad guy who does evil, then I must be good. Um, but if you don't pay close attention, that'll be this kind of simplistic, moralistic lesson you take from First and Second Kings. But again, if you start to read closely, you'll notice that this formula exists not to make things simple as much as to create a baseline uh, which the narrator then constantly adapts and modifies to draw out the full range of nuanced responses to God. So think of like this literary formula kind of as like your basic ingredients, like in a recipe. But if you give that to a master chef, they don't just follow that basic recipe. They start with it, but then they bring in all this other stuff 
to bring out kind of a, a whole range of flavors and uh, different variations of that basic uh, recipe. Um, so for each king, don't just ask, is he good or bad? Ask, how does the text narrate his goodness, his evil? Um, what exactly does that mean? And when you do that, you'll notice a lot more nuance and a lot more variation and just kind of a few things, which I just want to point out, which are kind of key for this, this story. One is that evil or goodness has to do with the posture of the heart, um, that that's, that's key. So in 1 Kings 15, for example, you get Abijah, uh, his heart, he committed all the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God, as the heart of David, his forefather had been. Or Asa, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. So he's not like Abijah. He expelled these male shrine prostitutes, got rid of idols, disposed this grandmother from her position as queen because she made a repulsive image of this false god. He cut it down. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life, and he brought things back into the temple. So you learn several things from passages like this. First, one, just this, this key thing that whether you do what is right or evil in the eyes of the Lord, it begins with the posture of your heart and your heart's devotion to God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And, the prim and one primary expression of devotion to God emphasized in this text is worship. So how does the text measure or assess whether a king has a heart of worship? Well, sometimes, like we saw with Solomon, it has to do with, did they visit the temple or offer sacrifice? But most of the time, the text me measures the quality of worship in terms of how tolerant are they of idols? It's not, do you go to the temple? The real question is, are you eliminating the rivals to God in your heart and in the land? And so this is going to be a major kind of uh, marker and expression that helps keep our hands on the pulse of the king's heart, whether or not they are willing to remove the false and foreign idols among them. And, you know, that that's not kind of an arbitrary thing for the text. It's really a matter of who do you put your trust in? Who does your heart put your trust in? A second thing we learn is that the heart's posture before God is not this black and white matter. It's not good guys and bad guys. While the text uses this standard formula, it constantly nuances and qualifies it. Asa is a great example. His heart is fully committed, but there's a sense in which the text narrates that he didn't fully act on those convictions. And we get things like that throughout. There's a whole range of responses. In fact, I found this one image that kind of charts, instead of like good guys and bad guys, uh, based upon the narration, you get you get kings that are really evil, some that are kind of slightly better, some that are like in the middle, like Asa, some that are seem to be really good or, or part of a revival, and, and some like Manasseh that are just terrible. So there's kind of this whole range of this. Uh, and a couple things to look at this graph is one, the vast amount are not good. Okay. So like there's a a culture, there's a culture of toxic hearts here uh, that's shaping who Israel is, um, but also that there's some dynamism to it, a range of responses, and there's actually some more dyna uh, dynamism than this chart shows. So even within an individual character's life, you'll get variation. So King Ahab, who's from the north, and this is just of kings of the south, so it doesn't have everyone. King Ahab, who does some of the worst stuff He's often described as evil, but at one point he repents and humbles himself and God shows patience to him. Or one of the best kings, Hezekiah, he tells God he has wholehearted devotion. See, he's, he's kind of put up here at the top. But in his final moments, he gets a little friendly with the Babylonians and, and makes an alliance with them that sows the seed for their destruction in the very next generation. So one of the goals of the text, I think, is to help us create a vocabulary for the heart and a way of thinking 
narrative ways to think about the range of our devotion to God. Uh, is my heart turned away from God? Am I half-hearted in my devotion? Am I fully committed? Am I acting on those uh, convictions? Um, and I think the heart's devotion to God is this dynamic reality in 1st, 2nd Kings. And two indicators that will come up often in the text uh, of heart devotion, in addition to idolatry, the two other big ones are inquiring of the Lord. Do characters pause and seek God before acting? And this becomes a key dynamic in a number of texts. And another one is, what I'd say is responsiveness. When confronted with something they did was wrong or evil, when the error of your ways is revealed, do you humble yourself? Um, so this heart business is one key way that the text is gonna to use to help the exiles answer the question, what went wrong? Did God fail us? Uh, if you look again at 1 Kings 9, let's see. Oh, I don't have this in here. If you look again at 1 Kings 9, you can turn that in, in your Bible there. Um, 1 Kings 9, it kind of serves as almost a, a guide for this heart stuff. And this is way back when we're still with Solomon, but it kind of foreshadows the story of the text. It said, when Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and achieved all he had desired to do, the Lord appeared to him a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart, God's heart, will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. But if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I've given them. I'll reject this temple I've consecrated for my name. Israel will become a byword, an object of ridicule among all peoples. This temple will become a heap of rubble. All who pass by will be appalled and will scoff and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and this temple? And people will answer. All right, so it's like the text is already being like, here's the answer. Because they've forsaken the Lord, their God, who brought their ancestors out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. This is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. So the text is pretty explicit about how it's narrating this tragedy. It's saying to those who saw the temple literally become a heap of rubble, and they're asking, did God give up on us? The text answer is, no, God told you at the beginning of this narrative, the fir first major king in this cycle, God's heart is with you. God's heart never left you. It's your heart. This whole current, this whole undercurrent of hearts turned from God that have drifted away and the sweep of your history, the undercurrent of your story, that's just that it's this major turning of your hearts away from God. So did God fail you? No, you turned away from God. Now we're going to, I'm going to talk later about, well, is God's response just to how uh, them, but this is the, the terms of it. This is about the heart and, and the text is clear. God's heart is faithful. God is present. God's heart's torn, turned towards them. It's our hearts that waver and turn away. That's how we got here. Um, so formulas like that, that recurring formula, it's trying to tell that story about Israel's heart and its pulse. Um, so pay attention to formulas and recurring formulas and ask, what are they doing? And, and, and how are, what are they teaching me here as I see them coming again and again? Um, a couple other big themes at stake in this book are communicated kind of through the big picture, the structure itself. And if you've been if you've journeyed our church for a while, I've, I've hope, hopefully in a sermon, I've introduced the idea of a chiasm, all right? Yay for chiasms. Hopefully this is not a new, but a chiasm uh, 
It comes from the, uh, it's named that because it, it's kind of a half of an X and uh, it comes from the Greek uh, letter chi, which is in the shape of kind of a big X. And it's a literary structure where there's one element at the beginning, say element A, at the start of a story or a passage, but then that same element is repeated at the end. And then the, and then there's kind of these different repeating parallel frames which center the story um, into kind of a, a, a key hub or turning point. And so, especially in a culture built on storytelling, uh, chiasms can be this way to kind of create frames of meaning to help us understand the big picture about what's at stake. And um, there's lots of them in the biblical narrative. And there's one way to look at the, uh, the meta structure of first, second Kings as kind of a giant chiasm. Um, so let me show this. And this is kind of, rather than repeat this, um, I'm gonna, I just kind of took a photocopy from a book. Okay? <laughs> Cause it was, uh, um, so I know this is a lot of text on here, but the idea is the big meta frame, um, which we saw before is kind of the beginning is the Solomon narrative and, and the Jerusalem uh, being built up and the temple being built up. And then the final uh, piece of the story is Solomon's dynasty and Jerusalem coming to an end, Jerusalem falling, the temple destroying. Um, but then if you look at the inner shell, uh, kind of inner shell, um, there's there's a story of the rise of the northern kingdom. It goes through that, their seven kings, and that kind of comes to a crescendo uh, with Elijah and his confrontation with uh, the son of Omri, whose name is Ahab, and his wife Jezebel. And that becomes kind of this dramatic piece. Um, and especially this uh, exchange between uh Ahab and Jezebel with this guy Naboth and how Elijah confronts them about that. And then later, uh, we're going to have Elisha confront kind of the legacy of Jezebel and uh, um, because of Naboth, like what they did to Naboth. And that'll be kind of start the fall of the northern kingdom and go through their seven kings. And then at the center of the whole book, are Elisha's miracle, are Elisha's miracles, not actually Elijah's, Elisha's mir uh, kind of a handful of miracles of kindness. And you get these chapters that stop referencing kings and it's just Elisha doing these interesting little miracles one after another. So this is kind of this one way you can kind of see this big structure where elements at one here are repeated over here and it kind of creates frames of meaning. So I'm gonna give you one take on why this is really significant. If you look at the very start, Solomon, the Solomon narrative, and we already saw kind of one take on that, but what is the thematic, what's at stake it with Solomon? Well, if you remember 1 Kings chapter three, Solomon asks for wisdom. But if you read that whole text uh, and he has that story of like, people come with the baby, whose is it? And uh, um, you know, he's like, let's cut it in two. And it kind of reveals who the real mother is. It's, it ends with the people praising Solomon because he had the wisdom to administer justice. And so justice gets introduced as a key theme in this book, that this is not just a story about worship and devotion to God. This is a story about justice, not just how you love God with all your heart, but do you love your neighbor as yourself and behave accordingly? And so the narrator with Solomon introduces the idea that the king is the one who is responsible for justice. That's how the start, that's how it ends in that frame A. How does it, how does it end in kind of the second A frame? What's some of the language the text uses to explain the end of Solomon's legacy? Well, if you read second, I think I got this up. Oh, nope. Sorry, I didn't put it on here. If you if you look at um, one of the final kings in Solomon's legacy uh, in the line of so Solomon is Manasseh. And kind of the take on Manasseh is found in 2 Kings 24. And this is like 
the point where God says, all right, this, this whole thing that started with Solomon, even, uh, even though I promised to kind of be faithful to him, this is when it's coming to an end. And it's fascinating. Uh, 2 Kings 24, verse 1, during Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land. So this is like the tragic end. Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. Then they turned against Nebuchadnezzar and rebelled. And so the Lord sent Babylonian, Aramean, all these raiders against him to destroy Judah in accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed by his servants, the prophets. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood and the Lord was not willing to forgive. And there's a sense that the story of Jerusalem and Judah it's about a failure of justice. And so God wrestled with and was actually patient with a lot of the idolatry for a long time. But when it got to shedding innocent blood, that's like my patience has run up. This cult, toxic culture now needs to come to an end. And so the, the kind of thing that the, the uh, what breaks the camel's back in terms of God saying, okay, now I'm going to allow exile uh, and allow Jerusalem to be destroyed is this radical injustice by Manasseh. So that's the big frame, justice introduced and a total breakdown of justice, like rampant injustice. Um, so that's one big frame. But then what, what's the rise and fall of the northern kingdom built around those kind of inner circles? It all kind of, it all hinges around uh, Naboth's vineyard. And this becomes a key part in the text. Even though Ahab and Jezebel, they do a lot of things and a lot of things in history. And there's a lot of narrative back and forth. The text really slows down to talk about how they have this neighbor named Naboth. And Jezebel just wants his vineyard. And he does, and he's like, no, this is mine. You can't have it. And so she has Ahab go and kill him. And they just seize it for themselves. They take possession of it. Uh, and so it's a breaking of that whole second half of like the Ten Commandments. Like, uh, you know, you have envy and, and greed and then there's murder. And, um, and so it's injustice. And the text makes a big deal about God's judgment on Ahab and Jezebel. It's in response to Naboth's vineyard. And then later, even though generations go by, the downfall of um, that kingdom, it kind of gets sets off. It, the text is huge on how God remembers what happened to Naboth, even though it's much later, and actually sends um, sends in other people to basically avenge this injustice and set it right. And there's a sense that God God cares about the blood that's being shed and uh, is going to bring just uh, whole, put things right and bring justice where there's been injustice so that this frame of like failure of justice and God dealing with it and holding people to account that's a key frame in what's going on in this narrative but then it brings all, which then brings all of our focus to these miracles of kindness by Elisha in second Kings 2 through 8 and what are they about well I'll give you a description of most of them God provides oil for a widow but why so she can pay off her debts and her two children won't be taken into slavery. There's this uh, woman, this elderly couple who uh, there's a miraculous birth of, of a child and that child dies and then it gets raised again. It's very interesting itself as a reference to Jesus, uh, but it's for an older couple who didn't have a future, right? Your whole kind of sense of future depended on having a child. There's a multiplication of food and it's to feed these hungry people of God. There's a healing of a military officer, Naaman, but it's this unexpected mercy to an outsider. There's this odd story that seems odd if you're not paying attention to all this, where a guy drops an ax head into water and Elisha makes it float back to the top. But it's so that if he had borrowed it and if he had lost it, he would have been in crippling debt. 
And so this miracle saves this man from debt. And so why are these stories in the center of the whole book? And this one commentator, I love how he puts it. He said, this unit, these Elisha stories, they may serve to illustrate and underscore the kind of righteous leadership or just leadership that Yahweh wanted Israel's kings to practice, defending and helping the poor and weak, as Elisha, Yahweh's representative, did so admirably, and as Israel's evil kings failed to do. So I just love this, right? Um, the whole text is bringing our attention to say, what's God about? Well, we saw the beginning. It's, it's, what are kings about? It's supposed to be about justice. But all these kings, it, it, this whole story of rise and fall is, is about their failure to do this. But you want to see what it really looks like? Look at the heart of this story. In the life of this prophet, he's helping the poor and weak. And that's where God's showing up, doing miraculous stuff, saving people from debt, being an advocate for the powerless. Um, and how does that answer the question, why are the people of God? Was it an injustice of God? Well, the narrative is trying to say, no, it's God's judgment on injustice. A major reason God lets them go into exile is for how they treat the poor. And what this says is God doesn't just care about the temple and the nation state. What God really cares about is, do you love mercy act justly, and walk humbly with your God. And that's why so many of the other prophetic books speak to just, uh, true worship and ties it into justice and mercy. Um, and so eg Israel's exile, according to kind of how this book is narrated and structured, it's made into a matter of, it's not God's failure, abandonment, it's a matter of God's righteousness and justice as a consequence of idolatry and injustice. Now, that's what the narrative's trying to say. So I just kind of gave away the book, okay? Um, one thing I naturally ask is, um, and I think we have to wrestle with this. So I'm not, I don't wanna give you an answer that wraps it up, right? Like we're all about questions here. Is this, is this a loving, like, what, how do we feel about, what kind of justice is this? Like, okay, they had, there was great injustice in the land of Israel, but God lets them go get thrown out into exile and Babylon sieged. It's pretty tragic. It is horrible. That's why they're disor disoriented. Well, I think there's at least one text that can maybe help us um, make sense of this. And this is kind of this is a little bit of my own reading. I can see where I put my Bible. Many of you know, way back at 1 Kings 3, that story of the parable that illustrates Solomon's wisdom to administer justice, right? Um, and what happens? A, uh, you can read along in 1 Kings 3. I won't read the whole thing. But two prostitutes come to the king and stand before him. And like they live in the same house and, and they each had a baby. Um, and uh, one of the babies died. And then the other, and, and then they're both, there's this debate about there's one baby left and they're each kind of claiming who it is. And they come to Solomon to say, who, who is the real mother? And Solomon goes, okay, bring me a sword. We'll cut it in half. You can each have half the baby. And, uh, it's this brilliant kind of move to get the real mother to say like, and one's like, great, cut it in half. And it's like, okay, that's the false mother. And the real mother's the one that's, I, give it to her. I'd rather like, I, I'd rather it go away from me and it, its integrity be saved uh, than having it here with me. Um, and so in the context, you're like, well, that's just a nice parable about um, Solomon. Like that's just really clever and shows how smart Solomon is. But you could also see it, it's I think one of the only parables in the whole book, uh, you could also see it as a parable and a foreshadowing of what the entire story of First Second Kings is about. Because in some ways, the whole story is who is kind of the true leader 
mother caregiver of Israel. And the false, the story is all about how the false mother, all the king, so many of the kings and leaders are the ones who don't care about the integrity and wholeness of the child they've been entrusted to care for, the people of Israel, and they're willing to divide it and lead it to self-destruction versus the true mother, God, who loves the child enough to save it from self-destruction from the false mother that they'll give it away, actually let it go out in order to kind of save it and let its integrity stay intact. Um, so it's kind of like a mom who sees a child in her home just kind of just acting so self-destructively and has this tough love that goes, I just can't let you keep doing this yourself. You gotta go outside the home and uh, come to your senses, but that's the only way to kind of restore you. But I'm not gonna let this kind of divisiveness and this hurting and self-destructive behavior continue. It's actually by letting you be put, put out, a, a love that's gonna let you put out in order for you to be restored. And I'd like to suggest that maybe, this is just kind of me interpreting the text a little bit. This is a one way as God as that true mother to read God's justice in first and second Kings and allowing the people to go to exile is kind of like that true mother saying, all right, none of this false business, these Kings are just dividing up the child. I'm gonna actually put the child out, but that's to save it. And it's actually by putting the child in exile when it's stripped away and no longer enabled, it's gonna come to its senses to discover like who it really is. Uh, so this, so one way to, um, so I wonder First Kings three, this whole thing with the, the babies, it's maybe a parable of, of the justice, God's like justice is that of like a loving mother who's trying to uh, save, save the integrity of her child from its own self-destructive tendencies. Uh, so I, I just put that out there to play with and uh, to think on as maybe a way you've never kind of thought about that story before. Um, all right, we're almost at time and I, oh, we're doing good. Okay, I might go slightly over nine. Um, we're almost at the end, but I just wanna point out a few little things. I've, I've kind of focused on what are these big ways and these themes in which the text is answering, did God fail? And we looked at, no, it was actually a fail of love of God, a fail, a failure of love of neighbor and God's kind of justice saying like, no more to this self-destructiveness, I'm gonna put you into exile. But where is their hope? And where is God in exile? I'm not sure if we'll get to this in the sermon series, but I want you to look at the very, if, if anyone got to read chapter Second Kings 25, it's the very last chapter of this whole giant book. And, uh, you know, there's the exile, it, that seems to be the end, and then, and then and all the remaining people flee to Egypt, and then there's this random final three verses. And if anyone read this, maybe they noticed, this feels really random. OK, uh, this is how first second Kings ends in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. So he actually kind of got exiled earlier in the year. Awil Marduk became king of Babylon. So there's a new king in Babylon now. He released Jehoiakim, king of Judah from prison. He did this on the 27th day of the 12th month, and he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat of honor higher than those of the other kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin put aside his prison clothes and for the rest of his life ate regularly at the king's table. Day by day, the king gave Jehoiachin a regular allowance as long as he lived. So on the one hand, this just feels like a totally random way to end the book. But on the other hand, if you're writing a story, telling this history to these people in exile, and you've just told this story of a tragedy and all the things that led to it, and now you're in exile being like, what hope do we have? This text functions as this hint that, but maybe there is a life to be had in exile. And if you look, if you read about Jehoiachin, he's actually not a great king. 
but yet he he gets and he's exiled, but he gets released. He gets kindness towards him, unexpected favor, and there's this way he starts to live and flourish even in exile. And so there's this hint to the readers of this book of you might be in exile and you might have turned away from God, but there's an existence, there's a life that might Uh, through God's favor that might be there for you. So what does that look like? How do we find that? Is it just random? Is it hopefully a king will release me? Well, there's a few other clues. There's this, um, the two major prophets in the story are Elijah and Elisha. And they're more in the center. And then after Elisha dies, you almost get no more. It's just like goes downhill. And it makes you wonder like, Did the prophets just kind of like what difference did Elijah and Elisha actually make in this story? Like maybe like they just kind of failed. Uh, But there's this really interesting little piece in 2 Kings 13 after Elisha dies. And I think it's a clue to hope. It says Elisha died. Okay, he was buried. (laughs) Now, Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once, while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they just threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. Now, on the one hand, if you just, when I first read this, I was like, this just is random. Okay, (laughs) like uh, tomb raiders, you got this guy, a dead body thrown in the tomb and then it comes to life. It's cool, but like weird. But what might this text be saying kind of at a more symbolic level that even when you're cut off in the death, in tomb, which that's what the experience of exile was like, if you come into contact with the presence of the prophets and their word and what they stand for, you might just come back to life. And so it's a, it's an image of in death there could be hope, there can resurrection. In exile, there can be a future. And so there's this clue in this text, in this passage to say, you wanna know where the hope is? The, The resurrection hope while you're down here in the ruins of exile? Pay attention to the stories of the prophets. Oh, well, maybe that's what all this Elijah and Elisha business is about. And so one way to read the stories of the prophets are not just random interactions with kings that go back and forth, but to see their presence in the text as as the answer to what does hope in exile look like? Where is God in exile as a vision of an alternative existence for faithfulness to God when you don't have a temple and you don't have like stability as a nation? And so Elijah, if you ask that question from Elijah's story, oh, you start getting all kinds of answers. Uh, You get this idea of, man, when false idols are in charge, God's alive and powerful and more powerful than those idols. So God's alive. So if I'm in a foreign nation where they're worshiping other things, I can have confidence that God is the one with the real power. Uh, I can remember that story of the prophets of Baal. Um, Or, right, in exile, you feel cut off. Elijah? He's on the run all the time and he feels cut off and alone and God keeps providing for him. He sends ravens to feed for him, this widow whose oil keeps multiplying. And so this idea that God can provide for you when you feel cut off, if you're in exile, that's good news. And lessons lessons from Elisha, and I'm not going deep here because we're going to spend some of our sermons um, on this. Elisha, you get this sense that I point out some of those passages that God, who was originally, everyone thinks, located in the temple, that's where things were moving for. Once this legacy of sin starts going, God doesn't show up in the temple anywhere before. Where does God show up? Out on the margins, out among the ministry of the prophets. Um, And so God's relocated. Um, And so what do you learn from Elisha? God doesn't need a temple to work amongst God's people. And God can move among the poor and the powerless, um, which is what you're feeling like when you're in exile. So that the prophets, not just interesting people are serving critiques as a king, they're they're 
Their stories are symbols of hope that are woven into the tragedy, that are hoping us see hope in even in tragedy. Um, okay. Wow. 904. Can I tell, can I share one more thing? Are we good with just a five more minutes? Um, okay. Joe did also ask a question um, oh. a, a little while ago. Is this an echo of Joseph? I think so, Joe. Yes, exactly. I think you read that and you're an Israelite and you're like, hold on. Technically, Mila asked me. the question. That was me. All <laughs> me. Yeah. So that, look at that. Boom. An echo of Joseph, right? It, how does the story end? You could be like, oh, random guy who gets released from prison. But if you're listening for echoes, where have we heard that before of someone in captivity being raised up with uncommon favor, Joseph? Uh, um, so yes, I think that's that's part of the, the hope they're supposed to latch on to. Um, the other thing that will not, I can't go into a lot here just because of time and hopefully we'll hit this in some of the sermons but hopefully you saw in some of the in some of this stuff that there's some pointers to Jesus, okay? And uh, in some ways, Jesus is going to be when Jesus comes, and if you read the Gospels, you're going to see lots of echoes of First and Second Kings. Um, but what's interesting is that I just want to give you one example. Um, uh, how first and second Kings prepares the way for Jesus. If you guys remember from my uh, scripture on ser uh, sermon on scripture as a symphony to think about, we get different narratives like Kings Chronicles that sometimes pull in different directions. And then to think about Jesus as sometimes recapitulating and reinterpreting some of these texts. Um, well, often if you look in the new Testament, see Jesus doing recapitulating things from uh, first and second Kings. So in second Kings one, you get a weird text. Elijah is about to be taken up to heaven. If you remember, if you look at the context and um, the King of Samaria is not a very welcoming person. And he sends, um, he sends some messengers to go uh, get Elijah and Elijah is kind of afraid of their inhospitality and he's defensive. And, um, and so it says uh, in verse nine, they sent a cap, uh, Elijah captain with his company of 50 men. The captain went up to Elijah who's sitting on the top of the hill and said to him, man of God, the king says, come down. And Elijah answered, if I'm a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and fire your 50 men. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. Okay, so like pretty intense. And Elijah's big on fire, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, well, Luke chapter nine, it's very interesting. The text says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. So the text references him, his ascension and kind of taken up. Who is the only other character taken up to heaven? Elijah. Okay, this sounds familiar. And they sent messengers ahead of him. So we got messengers again. Uh, and they entered a village of the Samaritans. Oh, someone about to be taken up and you're being encountered by Samaritans? And they did not receive him. Oh, and those Samaritans are not hospitable. And so the disciples, James and John, saw it. And you know what they're thinking? We know this story. We, we hear the echoes. We got another, we got Elijah 2.0 here. We know what to do. God, should we should we pull in Elijah and uh, Jesus? Should we pull in Elijah and command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? They're actually listening to the echoes. Jesus turned and rebuked them. Um, and so just want to lift this up as one place where Jesus, the New Testament will have Jesus both inhabiting the legacy of first, second Kings, but almost here it all, he all kind of uh, operates as a critique of um, how Elijah operated or kind of like Jesus, Jesus is like Elijah, but he's, he's different. He's recapitulating the story in a different way. And we're going to see Jesus in several ways uh, throughout the gospels remind us of direct reference to first and second Kings characters, but then kind of inhabit that legacy, maybe a little differently. Um, so I'll just leave that with you to think about as you go into the sermon series. Um,
Uh, all right, I'm gonna pause and uh, I see a couple here. Let me um stop sharing my.